and welcome to the One More Thing podcast. I'm Dr. Troy Doucet, and I'm joined today with Dr. Larry Bauckham. Good morning. Good morning. So this was week, what, four? Five. Five of Summer at the Lake. And I said in staff meeting, man, it was a a very unique approach to how you interpreted that that very famous passage in the scripture of the paraplegic being sent down through the hole in the roof as people are gathering around. So I have some questions today about that because it was very impactful for me uh, having, you know, so many years in ministry work and then to hear you from the stage say some of those those things was both a challenge and like it was like weight lifted in, in a theological way. So I wanted to, to get your take on, you said something and I love the translation that you used of the text. It, it read very smoothly. It was very story-driven, which you're a master storyteller. But you said something that as Jesus is noticing this bickering among the people, because he's saying your sins are forgiven. Like why, why was that notion culturally, historically, socially speaking for the Jews such an important piece of their theological identity why 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 is jesus saying that your sins are forgiven my brother why would why would that offend people so much and why why is it so offensive today to say that right. people's people are people are forgiven well in the jewish culture if i'm a rabbi or i'm one of the leaders sadducees or pharisees yeah you know, look at everyone else's you know they are heaped in sin you know you are steeped in sin at birth because you're blind or you don't have, you have these infirmities, anything that happened to you that was an infirmity or a handicap was seen as, well, your parents did something or you did something, or there's a, there's a huge amount of disconnection between you and God because the Deuteronomic view of history says blessings to those who do good. And if you want to obey the law of God, you'll be blessed. Mm -hmm. And there's some truth in that. But cursed are those who do not obey the God, law of God. They will they'll ultimately find their calamity. Well, and I think generally speaking, those are both true. Mm -hmm. But Job was put into the Bible, in my opinion, to basically confront the Deuteronomic view of history to say this teaching is flawed because bad things do happen to good people. Yes. And you and I both study the term theodicy, mm -hmm. which is, you know, how do you— how do you justify a loving, gracious, all-powerful God in the face of evil in the world? And that's the tension there. Mm -hmm. And, uh, the, uh, you know, theos means God. DC is from dikaisune, which means yep. righteousness. How do, you, how do you deal with God's righteousness with all these horrible things happening? The Jews were no exception to this, and they basically believed, hey, we're the super elite, yep. we're the super spiritual, and everybody else is not in our club. You have to do all the things we do. You have to say as many prayers as we pray. We have to do all the, follow all the rules that we follow to, yeah. to the tenth degree. If not, then you are a sinner. You're. It's us versus everyone else. Right. And it's the Jews versus the goyim, yeah. those outside the faith, yeah. and also those who who are Jewish but can't keep up. So look at this guy who was a paraplegic. Yeah. Automatically, the assumption strongly was. You have been steeped in sin. Mm -hmm. Your whole life you've been crippled or handicapped or whatever the appropriate term is. You cannot walk, and that's your, it's your fault. Mm -hmm. You have no connection with God. God only deals with wholeness, and you're broken. And Jesus came, and he sits down with all these guys around him, the riffraff, all the, the broken people, yeah. and he eats with them, and he embraces them, the marginalized. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that's really the essence of what the story is, is a, is a confrontation yeah. of Jewish system saying, your system is flawed, it's broken, and let me show you. Here's a broken guy, and he's accepted to God. Yeah, because yeah. The, like you said, the assumption would have been because of his, his lameness was sort of the, the the evidence of his sinfulness right right and jesus is like both of those are wrong yeah and and i think it's powerful what the way he does it and i think it's an indictment also on those of us today yeah. who are not careful we can fall into the same tribalism as the jews did yeah say hey it's we've got it we've got it figured out if you're not in our camp then you're disadvantaged or you're broken. And someday, maybe if God fixes you, you can be back in our camp. Yeah, yeah. Or if you ask for forgiveness, and I, I love to switch the word forgiveness for acceptance. Yes. That was not 
accidental. Yep. I think that when you look at the scriptures, there's three different types of language. Yep. One is uh, judicial language. You're declared not guilty. The judge declares whatever. And then there's this second type of language, which is sacrificial language. Mm-hmm. You know, sins, someone, something has to die, blood has to be shed, sacrificial language. The third type of language is relational. Mm-hmm. Most often, Jesus uses relational language mm-hmm. to talk about brotherhood and community. But he has to deal within the, you know, he's kind of be multilingual at yeah. times, and we do too. But the, the idea of forgiveness of sins to me, I have to go, well, first of all, what's a sin? Yeah. We have to talk about that. That's right. And if it's the fact that I'm I'm limping today because I slipped and broke my leg or my ankle or I had a knee replacement, yeah. uh, at some point we have to say, you know, these are infirmities, that, but they're not uh, in any way connected with our relationship with God. Yeah. It's funny. That's my question when I see on social media or other platforms when I hear the word sin, I'm like, what do you, what do you mean by that? Because they, they, sin has been used to, to, as like a universal connotation of just like immoral behavior or something like that. But yeah. I, I don't think that's how they, the Bible identifies it. And it, it goes to something I heard Jordan Peterson say one time, and I'd love your take on it because it, it relates. He says, when people ask me, do I believe in God? He goes, I hate that question because I go, first, what do you mean by belief? Like, mm-hmm. is it like an intellectual assent of some sort, or is it like a practical sense of how I live? So it's very convoluted, but we we think it's very simple. And that's why I loved how you took that interpretive play to say forgiveness is like this acceptance. Now, the question I have is that Suncoast, we, we tend to hold that that acceptance is universal in right. nature. And that you said it from the stage that that's caused you a bit of of personal sort of critique critique yeah yeah uh, locally and 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 beyond like yeah. tell yeah. us about that well primarily with my mother yeah <laughs> which you know but right. my mother represents a very conservative uh, strain of Christianity and here's what I I also um, very want to be very clear I grew up in that yeah that is my family it's my heritage. And I don't want anybody else kicking them in the shins, but I don't mind mm-hmm. because I think it's my, my place. But when you grow up in something, you, you see the holes in it and, you know, the whole simplicity, perplexity, you know, yeah. complexity, perplexity. It gets, yeah. you know, you move through that, those processes. Yeah. Uh, I try to love people who are in that. I mean, I was, we were talking earlier about, you know, what does radical inclusivity mean? I said, what, well, Suncoast, this is how radical we are. We'll even allow fundamentalists to come to Suncoast. Yeah. I mean, so people joke and say, well, you got to be kidding me. I'm not. We we need to quit damaging others who are not like us. That's right. And that's hard to do, especially when they're criticizing you for being, oh, you're just too loving. Suncoast, you'll let anyone go there. Suncoast, you believe that, that God accepts you. You always have been, always will be a son of God. Yes. So at what point do I do I need to pray the prayer of confession? Do I need to become born again? Yeah. And I would suggest to you that Jesus, uh, the only place he talks about that is with Nicodemus. I mean, with the, you know, at, at night, Nick at yeah. night. Yeah. But really the whole thing is about God is in all these broken, disenfranchised people. Mm-hmm. They are his kids. They always have been. And, and I love it when Jesus says, you know, even the son of man. I love that title. Yeah. So what he really is saying, I am the the son of humanity. Yeah. And I'm really trying to help you guys be better humans. That's right. Not better Jews or better whatever, but better human beings. That's right. And and sin, you know, if we say I'm a sinner, what does that mean? That means um, for me, when I'm less than my best, mm-hmm. and I do I sin against myself? Probably. But I wouldn't use that ancient sacrificial term. Yeah. I would use, you know, I'm less than my best when I do damage to others when I get uh, hot about something, when my anger level you know, gets too high or my mm-hmm. frustration gets too high, I need to take a deep breath, breathe in, breathe out, and smile and refocus because it's about loving people. Yeah. And Jesus did that. He did that to that guy. Uh, and I also was interesting, the, the faith comp, you know, it wasn't his faith. Everywhere else your faith has healed you. Your faith, That's right. But the guy had no clue. But it was the faithfulness of friends that brought him into the presence of Jesus that changed his world forever. That's right. 
And when you think about it, being a paraplegic, he had no choice in that. They were like dropping him through a roof. He's like, where are you guys taking me? Yeah, you know, yeah. that could be a nice play on that story as well. And what I love is that there was no repeat this prayer after me to have your sins forgiven. Believe in me. Like Jesus just like sins are forgiven. Like yeah. there's no criteria. There's there's no agenda. There's no doctrine. No statement that you have to sign in order to be in agreement with his position. Yeah. It's another insight into that could be, and I, I think I could uh, argue strongly about this, is maybe Jesus didn't didn't declare that in that moment his sins were forgiven or that he was accepted by God. Maybe he was saying, "You've always been. Yeah, you've been living out of a damaged concept, and yeah. these guys are not helping you." Mm -hmm. But you have been accepted from God forever. And in this moment, realize your acceptance and embrace it and get up. And the miracle is kind of a, uh, it's kind of a exclamation point. Yeah. The main point is you, you're accepted by God. Yeah. And that to me is, is powerful. And that plays into my last sort of question, which is a fun one. Because I think that story, the way you explained it there, plays into not only like your life even outside of Suncoast when you're just when you're when you're Larry in town and when I'm Troy in town but the idea when we get around people who don't know us or what we do or our titles and they're just being their authentic selves mm -hmm. and at times you know I'm not my best self you're not your best self and other people won't be their best self but you told that story of playing golf right and I think any pastor who has any sort of page of authenticity in them has been in that. And for me, that that reflects like that heart of of Jesus. Like, hey, dude, I accepted you even while you were dropping GDs and F-bombs. But now you want to change once something has been revealed when you didn't ask for that change. Right. Like, can you talk about that? And how do, how do you deal with that as a pastor? When people find out, and then you see this sh radical shift in their personality. Well, I, I, I give them the benefit of the doubt, first of all. Yeah, yeah. And, so, and sometimes guys would say things among guys they would not say with women around. Right. So there's a certain etiquette yeah. that's there. And maybe it, maybe it's the etiquette card that needs to be played. Maybe they're just realizing, I just this is a breach of etiquette. I should not talk about these things in front of a clergy. Right. Just like I wouldn't talk about it if I were playing with two women. Yeah. I wouldn't use the same language. So maybe that's part of it. And so we give them a pass there. Yep. The second part is that uh, I think there's guilt. <laughs> they, they just feel like, oh, my gosh, I have just, I'm just humiliated myself. And, and, you know, let the person without humiliation cast the first stone. I mean, I've been so humiliated uh, as well. Right. The big joke when I speak is I don't want to let God know what I'm speaking about too soon or he'll make me a, a humiliated example of what I'm going to talk about on the weekend. Yeah. So I try to keep it from him until like Wednesday <laughs> or Thursday. I don't have to live with it all the rest of the week. That's but, right. But, uh, you know, it's I think that people are people. Yeah. Uh, sometimes when I have traveled, I have intentionally not told people what I do. Mm -hmm. And my wife has noticed, too, that how people treat us differently. And I don't want to be treated differently. Just treat me like I'm an average guy, but uh, all of a sudden, you know, you, then I become the super spiritual, and I'm really not super spiritual. Yeah. I'm just a normal guy who loves God yeah. and feels like that uh, my life has been transformed by that acceptance of me, and that I want to teach. Mm -hmm. But I, I don't want to have to go through. You know, Suncoast is a unique animal, and everybody brings their own stuff. For yeah. example, my sister comes to see me. She's wonderful. She lives in Lakeland. She goes to a big Baptist church there, and they love their church. But she came down a year or so ago, and she and her husband, and I took them to lunch. So we go to lunch, and the first thing that we do is talk about how big their Sunday school class is, what they're doing, what da-da-da-da-da. And they feel like they have to talk to me about church-related things because I'm, I'm a pastor. Yeah. At some point, I said, sis, uh, can, we, can, I, can I just help you? I talk about church all day with my staff and so many people. Can we just keep our conversation about about your family yeah. and your kids and my kids? I really don't. I, I really don't. Am, I don't want to spend our time together talking about your Sunday school class. Mm -hmm. And it's not to take anything away from it. I just rather talk about something else. Yeah. Then uh, sometimes, when you say what you are, the conversation is driven for you. Yeah. And you can't have normal conversation. It becomes a super spiritual. 
a different type of style of conversation. Yeah. And when I'm on vacation, I really don't want to talk about uh, theological issues or doctrines. Yeah. Uh, I just want to talk about life and other things. Yeah, I love that because it goes against some of the, the more cultural fixation on we should always be talking about pray without ceasing and oh, all, yeah. all these these ideas. And clergy, that you know, I don't live on this pedestal. People put me up there and I keep jumping off. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and why are you up on the pedestal? Yeah. I don't live on the pedestal. I refuse to be on the pedestal yeah. because I, Jesus refused to be on there. That's right. And uh, and I do not want to take uh, advantage of my position in that area. I don't think it's healthy, and I don't think it's my best self. Good. So, my best self, you know, is just me. Yep. But it's not. You know the most right reverend, you know, a doctor. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Bach, Holy Mises, Reverend yeah. Bishop. The most yeah. right reverend, Holy One, Father, Doctor. That's my title. <laughs> but it's either that or Larry. And sometimes you're treated like the Holy Right Reverend Father, Doctor. Yeah. And I just prefer to be a uh, normal, a normal yeah. guy talking about normal things. Love it, man. Love it. So this week is the final week. Mm-hmm. Summer on the lake and a nice treat. It's going to be you and Pastor Brett up in dialogue. Right. Yeah. Any any insight what we can expect? Well, the theme is don't fall out of the boat, uh, which I think is fun because, you know, uh, what does that mean? Well, I'm going to explain what that means on the weekend. I'm going to talk about uh, a variety of things. I'm going to talk about some, some values and core values that are not ours but that others have that we share. Mm-hmm. Uh, but And some of the, you know, when people criticize you, the best response is not retaliation. Mm-hmm. But the best response, I think, is to live your life on a higher plane. Yeah. And uh, and that's a challenge for all of us because, you know, our natural re-jerk, knee-jerk reaction is probably not the best. That's right. But, uh, you know, when I just think that loving more deeply and showing the Spirit of Christ in me in a greater fashion is my highest and best good. It's good. So that's what we're going to talk about that a little awesome. bit. Awesome. Can't wait. We'll Meet. see you then. I look forward to it. Thanks. Thanks.